So welcome to Space Analog Stories. Today I'm speaking with Annika Mellis. Annika is a multidisciplinary scientist with roots in microbiology, engineering, and public health, who is passionate about connecting people. As an analog astronaut for the Austrian Space Forum, Annika is dedicated to furthering human space exploration, as well as bringing women into STEM. She also has a strong interest in sustainability, is an experienced speaker at a wide variety of national and international conferences, interviews, events, and workshops. Annika, welcome. It's such a pleasure to be speaking with you today. Yeah, hi. I'm happy to be here and to talk to you today. So um, is it okay if we just start with maybe if you gave us a little bit of a background on maybe how your interest for space first started and how you became a scientist and then eventually how that led to your role as an analog astronaut for the Austrian Space Forum? Yeah, sure. Um, so even though as a child I always was fascinated by space, my dad is an engineer and my mom as well. And um, my dad always built this little paper, uh, not paper, like the model airplanes and stuff like that. And we went to museums. And um, so there was a general interest there. Um, but I, did, I was not one of those kids that said, um, I want to be an astronaut when I grow up. I, I don't know. That was not one of the things on the top of my list. I don't know. Um, so yeah, I, um, after high school, um, since I kind of didn't know what I wanted to be when I grow up, um, I went abroad for one year and then I started studying um, biology because I always liked biology at school and I was like, okay, let's study something that you kind of enjoy. <laughs> um, so yeah, I did my first degree in, um, in microbiology and then life kind of happened and I got married and had kids and I did another degree in engineering for envi uh, environmental engineering. Um, yeah, and um, Right now I'm doing my PhD in public health, so it's kind of all over the place. <laughs> I, I always try to use stuff from my previous studies or the jobs I did and put them in use for the next one and to like kind of like building blocks and connecting things. That's kind of my main topic that's um, yeah, been there all over the years that I liked to use things from several um, areas to put them together and um, yeah make things better that way. So anyway, um, base. Two years ago, um, I saw an ad in my local newspaper that uh, the Austrian Space Forum was looking for new analog astronauts, and I checked out the website because it kind of sounded interesting or cool. Um, and once I saw what they do, I was totally fascinated, and I really wanted to do it. So I applied. Um, and in the beginning, I really didn't think that I would stand any chance because there were so many amazing people from all over Europe um, who already had PhDs in astrophysics and did their um, parish, uh, paragliding license, stuff like that. So I was like, okay, why did they invite me? <laughs> um, but uh, in, the, in the course of those um, selection rounds, uh, I really, I realized that besides the background in microbiology and engineering, which of course didn't hurt, um, a lot of soft skills, for example, yeah, to, to be um, calm under pressure, um, to work under stress, to be patient, to be able to lead people, but also let yourself be led if it's necessary, stuff like that. Um, yeah, that everything that I had done so far really fit very well in there. So in the end, it wasn't that much of a surprise for me that I got selected. So now since the end of 2018, I am one of the new analog astronauts for the Austrian Space Forum. Um, and last year we had our basic training, um, which were five months with a lot of different topics and, and skills that we had to learn. Um, and our mission was planned for this year in October, the one that we wanted to do next. Um, but since Corona happened, um, it was postponed to next year. Yeah, but maybe we talk about that later a little bit. Yeah, no, that's... Uh unfortunate but uh, yeah as long as it's only postponed and not cancelled then that's yeah fine. totally yeah <laughs> uh, so i heard that um the actual intake process for the austrian space forum analog astronaut is as rigorous as the esa and nasa astronaut selection process would you say that's true uh, since i haven't done the esa thing um i don't have the comparison i can't i wouldn't be able to say but um uh, yeah they told us that they oriented everything along the same lines um, we had to do physical tests a lot, like for fitness and, and stamina, stuff like that, um, psychology, 
um, medical tests. We were one day we spent at a medical facility to get tested thoroughly. Um, yeah, and then we did a lot of team building stuff. Yeah, and uh, fine motoric skills. So yeah, um, and everything was a test and a test. Um, you never knew what they were looking for and what the right solution would be. For example, we had to count rice. Um, there was black and white rice on a plate and we had to use chopsticks to separate them, to count them. <laughs> um, and we had like 45 minutes and they went around and clicked pens next to our ears and um, um, coughed and stuff like that to make <laughs> us nervous or to put pressure on. Um, and they were looking at how we were performing. Um, and I have no idea if they ever counted, like how, if, if he counted right, for example, <laughs> if that's counted into the selection in the end, or if they were just looking at how we were performing. Yeah, but stuff like that. So yeah. Um, yeah, and I, as I said in the beginning, it was so challenging that I didn't think that I would make it. But I think in the end, there were like 600 something factors that they counted in. Um, and I think the, the average or the overall performance, even if you, yeah, they were looking for the people who were not specialists in one very area, but who could perform overall and um, be flexible and adaptable, stuff like that. So I don't know what ESA is looking for exactly, <laughs> if they select for the same um, skills and, yeah, personality traits, um, but it sure was really challenging. It was eight days in total, so yeah. Yeah, that sounds pretty yeah. difficult. Um, so, in general, what do you think are some of the biggest challenges we've been faced with space exploration? And how do you think analog missions help to address some of these challenges mm -hmm. with that? Well, besides cooperating and getting the money and stuff like that, um, I think, for example, for going to Mars, which we do the analogs for, um, there are so many techno technological, yeah, technological, and um, human factors, challenges, um, that if you would try to address them by just um, theoretical science or by learning by doing, um, you, you wouldn't be able to make it. Um, so the analogs are perfect for testing out new ideas, for testing workflows and technology um, to make mistakes. Of course, there are a lot of mistakes made, but you learn from them and that's a fast process um, that you share with others. So they're able to pick up and um, get started from, an, from a higher plane, so to say. Um, so yeah, we are kind of like the shipbuilders for future missions. And um, one example would be the time delay, because now on the ISS, um, the astronauts um, communicate with mission control in real time. And if they have a problem, Houston or Oberpfaffenhofen or whoever is in charge right now can just look it up in their manual and send the answer. Um, but on Mars, astronauts will have to be way more um, self-sustained because, um, as you might know, or probably know that uh, the time delay is between, I think, seven minutes or four more minutes. In, uh, I think seven minutes is the minimum. I'm not totally yeah. sure, but anyway, several minutes, up to 40 minutes. Um, so we um, simulate 10 minutes. Um, so it takes 20 minutes for an answer to arrive. Um, and if your red light is blinking on your suit and after 20 minutes, Houston tells you, oh, that means your air is gone in three minutes. Um, you might have a problem. So we have to develop new ways of doing things. Yeah. So the astronauts will have to have different skills um, and a different level of autonomy on Mars. Just one example. Um, so what we do as the Austrian Space Forum is that we um, look at ways of doing, for example, an exploration cascade, if you want to look for traces of life, um, how to go about it and um, which steps along the way are going to be necessary. Plus, um, we are developing a spacesuit simulator, which is not a spacesuit that, that would actually, li like it is now, it wouldn't work on Mars, but it's simulating several aspects of that. Um, so we can test them out and see, for example, how the suit interacts with the rovers or the drones, how um, the astronauts get their information about their own suit system and about their surroundings, how they navigate, um, how communication is going to be established, stuff like that. And um, then we have a lot of experiments that several universities from all over the world or um, even some of the agencies um, give to us. So we perform them and they get the results to publish them and to use them in later studies. Um, and we also have contracts 
for example, with ESA for textile development, stuff like that um, for future missions. And a big aspect is also um, education outreach, um, getting people interested in STEM and um, yeah, as you are doing, um, just getting them excited about thinking and about um, exploring things. Um, so I think the, the whole aspect of thinking and developing new technologies and working together is something that those analog missions are really good for because a lot of people come together from several countries with a lot of different backgrounds um, yeah, and work for a common goal. Um, and I th actually for space flight as well, I think that's one of the main aspects. People are always going on about technology and everything, but it's one of the very few areas today where people from all over the world really get together and, and, and reach something um, which can't be overrated at all. So yeah, yeah, or yeah. not rated high enough. That's what I want to say. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so with the Amity 20 mission that was obviously happen mm -hmm. going to happen this year, but now it's been delayed. Um, do the missions happen in different locations? Because I know that one was going to happen in was it Israel. Yeah, exactly. Um, so the Analog Austin, uh, the, the Austin Space Forum is doing missions every two to three years. Um, and they have been to several locations. Uh, 2018, they were in Oman in the desert. Um, before they have been to Spain or to ice caves in the Austrian Alps. Um, so they are trying to look for locations that simulate the, some aspects of Mars. And um, the location in Israel is in the Negev desert. Um, and it's, um, there's a crater, which is not made by an impact, but by um, wind and water. Um, and that's a spot where you could simulate technologies to look for traces of life, because that's an area that you would look for on Mars, somewhere where water shaped it and where water was present. So you could expect to find any traces if there were some. Um, plus, it's remote locations where you are really isolated, where help will take some time to get there, to get you into this feeling of yeah, being far away from civilization because the psychological uh, or psychological oh, difficult word psychological um, implications or impact on on group uh, cohesion and um, yeah on performance of the astronauts is also a big aspect, of course, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So do they, when they choose their location, uh, do they have like the kind of mission parameters or the, the experiments tailored towards that environment? Is that how they choose or do they choose? The yeah, um, it's a really complicated um, process. And okay. once uh, one mission is running, the preparations for the next one are already on their way because it takes a lot of time to get all the contracts with the several countries and all those partners and stuff. Yeah. Um, and yeah, the Austrian Space Forum is trying to build um, on uh, previous missions. So this exploration cascade, cascade they developed um, is something that they are looking to yeah, implicate or to, to make it better with every mission. So they think about what they want to look for for the next or during the next mission. Um, and for example, if they say, okay, let's try to find the best way to look for traces of life, um, then they think about which area would be good. And then they look on, let's say they are looking for partners over the world where it would be possible to do the mission since it's um, private. It, there's no big organization behind it that finances it. Um, people are, as for example, we as analog astronauts, we don't get paid. It's something we do um, because out of passion and uh, the stuff that we get to do and um, people we get to meet. Um, yeah, and so you have to get partners on board for the technology and for sponsoring and stuff like that. Um, yeah, so it, it might not be possible to go to Antarctica, for example, even though that would be a perfect spot to test stuff. Um, yeah, and then um, there's a call going out um, about one year before uh, the mission starts to interested parties to reach an experiment and then experiments get selected for how they fit into this overall mission um, pr prerogative. Yeah. Um, exactly. And then everything gets planned around that. Yeah. Yeah. So um, what was your favorite part of the training, let's say? Ooh, that's really hard to say because um, that's actually the thing that I like most about it, that um, everything is so much fun because um, you get to challenge yourself, you get to do things you wouldn't be normally able to do. 
um, and you get to work with amazing people. Um, it's such a good feeling to be in a team where um, yeah, you, you are appreciated for the way you are or the things that you can do and where you communicate with each other and everybody's so considerate and everybody has a background of, um, yeah, well, not only science, but like kind of an open thinking. Um, so you can interchange ideas. And uh, so even every time I get together with those people and get to work with them, that's just a joy in itself. Yeah. But there were some things that I really liked for example, we got to um, pr practice quad bike training. So we went to one of those old quarries where a lot of hills are built up of, out of old materials. Yeah. And then we got to practice driving around and over them. And so, oh, wow. so and that, was, that got pretty crazy and was great fun. Um, yeah, and then uh, once we went to Stuttgart in Germany, um, because at the university there, they have a simulator where you can dock the Soyuz to the ISS. So we practiced docking, um, which was great fun in itself. And then um, at the same time in the evening, the ISS was going over our location. So we went up on the roof of the university building, like 10 minutes after we docked the Soyuz to the ISS in training. And then we saw the ISS flying above us. And it was <laughs> so like cool. just this amazing feeling like waving up there. And so, hi, I know how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was, that was pretty cool as well. Yeah, yeah. that was pretty cool. Are there any um, funny or interesting stories you can share with us from your time there? Funny or interesting? Well, I mean, um, I mean, I should the... have any, but one that comes to mind. Yeah. Every, I, I don't know what's interesting to people, but um, for example, every training starts with a morning run, where about six o'clock in the morning at minus ten degrees, we have to run up the Alps in Innsbruck. Um, like four or five kilometers uphill <laughs> and um, there's only two women so it's me and another one from Germany and all the guys are like you know and we are running and trying to keep up and it's kind of uh, it, I would say it's interesting <laughs> yeah anyway and um, funny stories I mean it's not like any any strange things happen but um, yeah just meeting interesting people I've met like two or three astronauts um, on several occasions and um, people from ESA and people that I would normally not be able to talk to in my private normal life. Um, and yeah, it's just so cool to be part of this whole space community, which is connected over the whole world. I mean, of course, right now, so many things are online, uh, which is a big plus, I think, because before that you had to fly to some space, um, conferences and um, that always was a problem money-wise and time-wise um, and now you're able to um, take or to yeah take part easier um, yeah yeah so there's not one special part that I would say is most fun or interesting but the whole thing is really amazing yeah that sounds that sounds it anyway um, so if, imagine you had uh, a friend who wasn't particularly interested in space, how would you get them excited in space? Yep, just by telling them about what I do, because since I'm not the, the typical physicist or whatever is uh, in people's mind that you have to, or pilot or whatever you have to be to become an astronaut or analog astronaut, um, yeah, I just tell them how it feels like to go somewhere and um, do crazy experiments, as not crazy in per se, but like for myself, I'm a microbiologist. I have no idea about geology, for example, or I didn't have any idea about it. Um, but you get trained in taking rock samples or you do medical experiments, um, you do um, psychological testing. Um, so you get to take a peek at so many different subjects that everybody would find a place where they could contribute. If you are a designer who knows about fabrics and can build a spacesuit, or if you are a lawyer who could um, consult people on how to do contracts, for example, uh, ESA and all the other agencies right now are talking about how to build Lunar Gateway, the next um, space station that will orbit around the moon, um, and they have to check out who's giving which uh, module and how everything is going to work out. So you need lawyers for that. Um, you need doctors, you need engineers, um, you need nutrition specialists, you need biologists, and so on and so on. 
Um, yeah, and I think that's the amazing part about it, that everybody would find some place where they could dock onto it and live their passion and still contribute to space flight. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, definitely. So let's say you had the opportunity to actually go to Mars for real. Would you want to do that? Yeah, I get that <laughs> question a lot. <laughs> um, I'm not sure. Okay. Depends on when that is and how everything would be safe technology wise and everything. Um, I think that if I would get the chance to go, go on one mission where you go there and stay for four weeks and then get back and it's like two and a half years or three years in total, which is like the plan for the first missions. Yeah. I would probably go. Yeah. <laughs> Even though it's a big risk and you have to spend ages in a tin can um, without air and everything, uh, without blue skies and, you know, yeah. like nature and everything. Um, yeah, I think, I think I would try. Yeah. Um, I would totally go to the ISS or anywhere close to Earth. I, uh, of course, tomorrow, if you let me, I would do it. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I, I don't know. I don't think that I would go on a mission without return. I just like my life on Earth too much. Yeah, well, a one-way yeah. journey is a lot to ask of anybody. Else. Yeah. Uh, so let's say you were on that long journey to Mars. Uh, what one item would you want with you, uh, non-digital item? Yeah. I think I might try to take a plant just to have some green and to have something else living, yeah. if that would be possible, yeah. yeah. I know, it's, it's a hard question. If you yeah. think about it more, I mean, if I would actually go, I would think about that hard and long. <laughs> <laughs> and aside from obviously your friends and family, what do you think you'd miss the most about Earth? Yeah, but I think open spaces and freedom of movement um, I'm a runner, so yeah, I go out running almost every day and I would absolutely miss that. And then feelings like the air on your face and um, seeing the sky and having wide views and nature, like sound of rain and, and animals, plants. I think that's kind of, yeah, I think that are things that if you have them, you don't really realize how important they are. Um, but maybe because of COVID, some people or more people than before can relate to that. And if you are locked in and can't get out, um, that are some of the things, except the social interaction that you really miss, but the, the nature thing, I think. Yeah, it's really I would miss that. take things for granted. I mean, just yeah. me having been in the dome, this is like my first day, not being able to look out uh, mm -hmm. through a window or anything, yeah. even that is yeah. <laughs> after a few yeah. hours, I noticed. Yeah. yeah. Um, so what's next for you uh, in terms of space and also your work outside of the Austrian Space Forum? Yeah, um, so our mission got postponed to October of next year from 4th to 31st October of 2021. So training for that is supposed to start up again somewhere in the beginning of next year. Of course, depending on how COVID is going to go and how everything works, but that's the plan anyway. And I am pretty confident that we are going to manage that um, all the big partners and the Australian Space Agency and DMARS from Israel, they are all still on board. Um, yeah, so now everything is getting a little bit quiet and then everything is going to ramp up again um, in March, maybe April of next year, um, which is not so bad right now because, um, yeah, since I told you already, I'm uh, still writing my PhD um, and I can totally use the time now <laughs> to finish that. Um, and then, well, what do I do? Um, I give online uh, workshops um, for coding for um, uh, primary school teachers to get them interested in it and get them started um, and take away the fear that they are like, oh, coding, that's so complicated, I can't do it. So yeah, that's what I'm doing. Um, I'm doing translations. Um, I'm a lecturer. Um, I give keynotes. Of course, everything's online right now, but that's fine. So I, I mean, I like, I really like traveling, um, but if it's too much, then it's kind of complicated family-wise. So I like it getting a little bit more quiet because you can do it online. Um, yeah, and I'm consulting on different topics for several firms and um, local government bodies um, uh, for public health um, issues and also um, space-related stuff. So that's kind of, I'm still figuring out how to put that together and the whole sustainability thing. Um, 
is really a good uh, way to look at it because if you use satellite data, for example, for urban planning or for uh, sustainable development in developing countries, there are so many applications where health and environment and space flight or satellite data interconnect. Um, and so much is happening right now in that field. So that's what I'm kind of trying to do. And um, I'm really getting into the whole education thing and, and um, inspiring people. Um, and, uh, extremely busy, certainly. <laughs> well, I do like small things every day. So it sounds yeah. more than it is. At least that's my feeling. <laughs> if you t tell everything at once, of course, it, it sounds a lot. But um, no, I was, yeah. was going to say, like, how do you balance that with your, you know, being a parent as well? I mean, that's quite a juggling act. If you have any advice for people on how you manage to sort of balance your life. Well, that's one of the things I was selected for, organization and time management. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I have a great support system. I wouldn't be able to do it without my partner and my parents and my parents-in-law and all my friends. Um, and yeah, as I said, I think if you talk about it and tell people I do this, 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 and it sounds like, oh my God, it's so much. Um, but of course, um, today I have the talk with you and I had another telecon where I planned something for tomorrow. And um, the rest of the time I go running and I visit a museum and I write uh, a few hours on my PhD and that's it. I mean, that's like eight hours of work like everybody else. Um, and in the evening I go and have a talk with my brother whom I'm visiting right now. So yeah, um, you have to take little steps and um, like advice is or uh, on that side, I always try to follow kind of my gut feeling that I do things that I'm passionate about with people that I like to work with um, and that I open a lot of doors and like prepare myself to be ready when things happen from the outside and then sometimes it's like two or three weeks where nothing happens from the outside and I'm getting a little bit antsy because I'm like oh nothing's happening and then you have four people calling you and having suggestions or um, like asking you for something or where something develops. And then you have to be ready to jump on that and to see where it leads and to make the best out of that. And then from time to time, I kind of take a step back to see if everything still fits together, if something needs to be left out or taken in um, and how it fits my general, like what I want to do in the future. But I myself do not have like this master plan. I mean, a lot of people plan their career from an early age and are very goal oriented, which is fine if that's their type, how they are. That's not the way that I work kind of. Um, yeah, I'd rather not know where I'm going to be in two years time. I only know that I want to enjoy the way there and that I want to even, it sounds cheesy, but I want to make the world a little bit better along the way. And yeah, yeah that's kind of my philosophy. Important. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, is there anything else you'd like to share with us today, Annika? And uh, how can people follow your work? Um, I want to share that I would er encourage everybody to um, yeah, take a look at what they like to do and how they can apply it. Because even people that are like, oh, I can't do anything. I'm not special, whatever. Everybody has something that they are good at and that they can use and um, find ways to make their life enjoyable and if you do that then it's kind of I don't know it's a given that by that you will make a positive impact on other people's life and um, yeah reach something that you want to reach um, and if there are any obstacles don't give up and don't feel like oh okay it's not working because most of the time the things that, that don't work are actually the ones that bring you farther and that um, open up new doors that you didn't even see before um, and that's actually what analog astronauts do. We find mistakes. We find the things that don't work so others can make it better and um, prepare the way for people um, so they don't have to make the mistakes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and to follow me, um, I'm on Instagram mostly. That's my platform where I kind of share my story, what I do during the day and um, yeah, all the analog stuff, um, but also some personal things. And then I'm on LinkedIn and Twitter and Facebook, but um, yeah, just not as active as on Instagram. <laughs> yeah. And, and of course, Google Scholar and everything, because I do have a small academic career that I'm still <laughs> pursuing. And um, yeah, I'm publishing papers and going to conferences, stuff like that. Um, yeah. 
Thank you so much, Annika. Thank you so much for talking to us today. You're very welcome. Yeah, I enjoyed talking to you. <laughs>